Welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and we've got another great show for you today. On today's program, we'll be talking about coal crops, unusual edibles, and we'll focus on fruit trees. Speaking of fruit, there is nothing like eating a peach, an apple, or cherries freshly picked from a tree you've got in your own backyard. Growing fruit trees can be very rewarding, but they do take time and care to go from blossom to a pie filling. And believe it or not, there are some things you can be doing in the dead of winter to help your fruit trees. Here to tell us more are backyard farmer panelists Jim Kalish and Kyle Broderick. They're talking about dormant season fruit tree care. We always talk all the time about all these different methods by uh, controlling insects and diseases and it uh, looks like we ought to take ownership of some of that for ourselves, right? Yeah, you know, there probably are some things that can be done yeah. this time of year, aren't there? Yeah, I mean, especially like when we're talking about apple trees, mm -hmm. you know, and from the standpoint of, of right now, sanitation is really important. I mean, that's, that can be done right now during the winter season, picking, uh, raking up all the leaves, because I know that there's a few insects that love to overwinter down in that leafy litter and even in the soil just below the leaves. So all that exposure to the cold weather helps to kill them. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah. you know, and I know that uh, raking leaves will really help control certain fungal diseases as well. Some yeah. of those foliar fungal pathogens, will they will overwinter yeah. on, those, on those leaves. So I guess raking would be a good yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, what about pruning? I know yeah. we, we, we recommend pruning um, this time, well, kind of in the, in the winter, once, it, once the trees are dormant, if there are any cankers or anything like that that are being yeah. seen, and that can help decrease some disease problems next right. year too. Yeah, I was, that's right, because I think somewhere about uh, February to maybe early April, as, early, as late as early April, you can prune, so. Yeah, yeah, I kind of think once the, uh, really once the trees have, have gone dormant, and mm -hmm. then is, if you know that you're going to have a couple of days without much moisture, yeah. I think that's really a good time to prune. Yeah. Um, although one thing, if we are talking about pruning and yeah. looking at, at cankers or just some dead Mm -hmm. Dead tissue on the um, Man, on the branch. It's ugly. It is ugly. Not not very sightly, unfortunately. Yeah. But when you are pruning down, you want to make sure to prune far enough down that you'll remove a lot of the inoculum that may yeah. may be in that canker. So you'll want to mm -hmm. be sure to go at least eight to twelve inches yeah. down. Yeah. Good. So I guess sanitation mm -hmm. can, quite a bit, quite a bit can be done with sanitation right now. What about uh, chemical treatments? Yeah, what, what do you guys do in plant pathology? What, uh, what's the usual procedure for before before the buds break next spring? Yeah, you know, I guess one thing that it really depends what what diseases you're going to be trying to control. But there, um, some dormant sprays can be fairly effective. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about these dormant season sprays is they can be selective, and there's really not as many competing organisms out there um, yeah. to take up some of those chemistries as well. Right. Um, yeah, you know, in the entomological world, um, a lot of the insects uh, can be uh, hiding in uh, bark crevices or beneath bud scales. And so um, just about before bud break during the dormant season, it's really a, a good time to be applying uh, a, a horticultural oil spray, a highly refined oil spray, which essentially smothers the early stages of something that's crawling around or eggs or that kind of thing. And so just thorough coverage with a dormant oil spray before bud break, maybe a week or so before bud break, and just when some of these things are getting, these little critters are getting active on the, the trees and the branches, it's a good time to spray to kill a lot of those off and to save some uh, problems that would develop later. It's important to apply a dormant oil spray well, the temperatures are somewhat warm, but not too warm. And so that time of year in February is fine. Okay. Yeah, and so one thing that, that I remember reading about uh, doing some, some dormant season sprays is if, if you're going to a, be applying any copper-based products mm -hmm. to control diseases such as um, oh, fire blight or maybe um, some of those others, that you want to wait to apply that at least seven days after any one of your oil mixtures. Um, yeah, okay. So, so really, you want to just make sure to wait at least at least the week before applying those right. uh, Bordeaux mixture or another copper product right, if need be. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is you also um, need to allow about two weeks between applications of um, copper products, and then if you're going to be applying some more fungicides such as those containing sulfur. 
Yeah, or, or even like or that. even an oil spray again. Or an oil spray. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you want to make sure that there's enough time it's separated in between. time wise. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's so many uh, products available, right? We even have we have various right. dormant oil sprays. And then what about your fungicides? Yeah, um, there are there are fungicides that are developed to be sprayed really any time of the year. One thing, if you are going to be applying any chemistry, you want to make sure to really follow the labels that are, are on the mm -hmm. are, that exactly. are on there. Um, exactly. The label, the label is the law, and so what it says on there, you need to go by. That's right. Thorough coverage too. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We're going to be hearing more from Jim and Kyle later in the show when they discuss in-season care for the apple trees. As you know, our Go Gardening features are for beginning gardeners, and this week we're going to be focusing on coal crops. If you don't know what that is, think of all the green vegetables you probably hated as a kid, but you can't get enough of now, things like broccoli, kale, and cabbage, which are all part of the coal crop family. Right now we're going to tell you how you can grow these delicious and healthy vegetables. This week on Go Gardening, we're going to be talking about growing coal crops or cold crops, broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, those kinds of things. The interesting thing about them is they do like it cool. You can start a handful of them uh, in the garden directly when the soil is warm enough but not too warm. Broccoli is one that you can do that with, with some success. For the most part, it's easier, especially for beginning gardeners, if you actually buy transplants. But again, think in terms of these particular vegetables as being ones that do like the cooler season. So you can plant them early in the spring and harvest. You can actually seed and start your own transplants depending on what your variety is and, and when you're looking for harvest. You can actually use these as a fall crop as well. And some of them are very successful in the fall, particularly Brussels sprouts. They actually improve in flavor if they get frost on them. The interesting thing about Brussels sprouts also is once those little sprouts start to develop all the way up the stem and once it gets cooler, if you pinch that, that growing point out at the top of the stem, what that will actually do is allow those Brussels to be a little bit more uniform in character. One of the hardest ones to grow for a home gardener is cauliflower. Uh, cabbage, again, can be relatively easy. We have some great All-America selections. You do have to watch with all of these great coal crops for such wonderful little beasties as the cabbage looper, the cabbage worm, the beautiful white and kind of yellowish butterflies that are flying around. When you see those guys flying around, they are interested in laying their eggs and then you've got those cabbage worms. So one of the recommendations to keep them out is to actually use floating row cover. That will really help in that process. But again, if you think in terms of cold crop, meaning cold crop, early season to not the heat of the summer or a little bit later in the summer into the fall, you're probably going to be successful. Those vegetables that your mother probably couldn't get you to touch when you were a kid are really some of the healthiest ones you can eat. So do make it a point to try some of the easier ones in your garden next season. Speaking of eating, for this week's landscape lesson, we're going to show you some plants that you may not have considered edible. One of the newer trends in the horticultural world is an edible landscape. If you think about it, we grow vegetables, we don't think about eating flowers, and we certainly don't think about vegetables where you can also eat the flowers or the stems. So let's take a few minutes to talk about those unusual parts of plants that you could grow and then eat around your own home. For this week's landscape lesson, I want to focus a little bit on a few plants that actually have multi-purpose use. We all like to multitask. These are actually things you can eat that allow you to eat more than one plant part. Let's start with hibiscus, beautiful flowers that last one day. They actually taste like a very tangy, very interesting cranberry. So you can eat the blossoms, pull the stamens out. They are, they are not great to eat. If you've ever had hibiscus tea, that is the, the uh, taste that you get from the hibiscus. A second really interesting one to me is okra. If you're from the south, of course you eat okra. If you're from the north, you think of it as a slimy thing that's in soup. Not true. You can grill the pods, you can roast the pods, you can slice the pods, you can pickle the pods. 
interestingly enough, you can also eat the flowers, which are very, very beautiful. And this is related to hibiscus, so maybe that makes some sense. A third one that most people are really familiar with is sunflower. We think of eating sunflower for the seeds. You can't go to a baseball game without sunflower seeds, of course, or you feed the birds and they like sunflower or safflower. So the seeds certainly are edible. So are the flower petals and the buds can actually be eaten like artichokes. So you think about the form of that bud of a sunflower and they kind of look like a little bitty artichoke. So another really interesting way to think about using a, a, a plant as an unusual edible in your garden. Of course, a lot of people like peas, don't like to pod them necessarily, but they like to eat the snap peas and eat the whole pod. You can eat the tendrils or the, or the tender shoots of field peas and of regular edible peas. They're very tasty in salads. You can also eat the flowers of peas. You do want to be careful, however, because if they are not peas that are meant for consumption, if you eat, for example, the peas of sweet peas, which are grown for the flowers, those are poisonous, you're going to go belly up, or at least your belly is not going to be happy with that. Eating those unusual plant parts might seem a little bit weird, but as the saying goes, do not knock it until you actually try it. Okay, let's get back to growing and eating plants that you know and really enjoy. Fruit trees can offer an array of benefits in your outdoor living space. Many of them have incredible color during the spring when they're flowering, not to mention the sweet and juicy fruit they produce. Caring for those trees can be challenging, so we thought we'd talk to a real expert. Here's Kimmel Orchard Manager of Operations, Vaughn Hammond, to talk about growing our fruit trees the right way. During the regular season of Backyard Farmer, we get a lot of questions about growing fruit trees in Nebraska. It's my pleasure today to be able to have Vaughn Hammond with us. Vaughn is a former Extension educator with the University of Nebraska Extension, but he now has a great new position, and he is Orchard Operations and Education Team Leader for Kimmel Orchard and Vineyard down in Nebraska City. Vaughn, absolutely great to have you with us today. Thank you, Kim, I appreciate it. So I'm gonna ask you a handful of questions here that I know our viewing audience is going to want to hear the answers to. People wanna grow good fruit crops the following season. What do we have them do during the winter months in Nebraska? Well, first and foremost, this time of year, it's pruning. It's very important that you're pruning when the trees are completely dormant. And so when the trees are dormant, that means all the carbohydrates and, and all the essence within the plant has transferred to where they need to overwinter, like to the roots or to the buds or wherever it may be. So when you're pruning when it's dormant, it allows the plant to take that pruning without damage. And then it concentrates those, those carbohydrates in the areas that are important. So when you're pruning this time of year, I would say 95% of the folks out there pruning do not take enough wood. The old um, orchardist adage was if you could take a bushel basket and throw it at your apple tree and it landed on the other side of the apple tree without touching a branch, you'd prune properly. That's changed a little bit now. They say throw your hat. But it's still the same basic principle is you're removing the excess wood to create more fruiting wood. Alrighty, so a lot of people like to grow apples, which seems to be a fairly easy crop, but tons and tons of questions about peaches and maybe even apricots last year. Are there specific things we wanna talk about to make sure that those will produce fruit? You know, peaches and apricots are, are very popular as far as the, the, uh, the home gardener goes. Uh, who doesn't love a delicious peach or apricot? The problem with peaches and apricots are they are, tend to be very early blooming, which then gives them the opportunity of having those uh, late frosts uh, situations where um, those flower buds are frozen off. Case in point this year, um, we're probably gonna be in the 50s in February. That's about the temperatures when a peach tree and an apricot tree are starting to wake up and those buds will start to swell. And if we have any prolonged period of time in February and March of warmer temperatures, those trees are really gonna to wanna to bloom 
way earlier than they should. And so this is the problem getting a nice crop off a, a peach or, a, or an apricot on a consistent basis. This year we've had some terribly, terribly cold weather. Um, at one point in time we were as cold in Nebraska as the Antarctic was. So once you start to hit like 10 degrees below zero, it really starts to affect the peach buds and the apricot flower buds for that matter. And so as we crept down to 19 degrees and parts of the state were even 20, 21, 22 degrees below zero, that's getting pretty cold. I'm not saying that we won't have a peach crop, but terribly cold weather does have an effect on peach blossoms. In front of you, you have a rather odd looking device and it what is this thing and what in the world does it have to do with doing anything for good fruit production? Well actually this is a very important tool for us in the orchard. Uh, believe it or not this little it's a, it's a coddling moth trap and this is this is a very interesting uh, piece of or tool in the orchard in that this helps us reduce pesticide use in the orchard. By using this little trap we could become much more environmentally friendly. So this little button here is infused with the female sex pheromone of the coddling moth and you place this in the trap and this pheromone attracts the males. You put this trap about six to seven foot tall in the in the tree when the apple blossoms start to show pink. Okay and at that point in time science gets involved. You start counting growing degree days. And if you have a heavy coddling moth problem, you're shooting for about 180 to 200 growing degree days. So once you catch the first adult male in this trap, you start counting the growing degree days, and when you get to 200, that's when you spray. In the past, folks just started spraying. Come May 1st, they just sprayed. Sprayed every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks. This allows us to reduce our spray inputs into the orchard, thus reducing impacts, environmental impacts on, you know, beneficial insects and, and, and other non-target uh, insects out there or organisms and not just necessarily insects. And so as this continues, um, if the coddling moth problem is extremely heavy, then at 1,250 or degree growing days or so, or so is when the second hatch takes place. So you continue to monitor this and uh, then you spray again. Vaughn, thanks a million for coming all the way up from Nebraska City and sharing all that great information with us today. It was absolutely my pleasure. I always enjoy it. Each variety of fruit trees needs to be cared for carefully and thoughtfully throughout the growing season. Keeping the diseases, insects, and birds away can be a pain, but you'll be glad you did when you sink your teeth into that ripe apple or peach. Okay, it's time for us to answer a few of your questions. You can submit your questions via email to byf at unl.edu. Our first question comes from a really loyal viewer, but this is sent from Lisbon, North Dakota. He has an autumn blaze maple, and this autumn blaze has thrown a double leader in youth his question is which one of these should be pruned so he can really create a good structure for that tree when it's older and when should he do that pruning? So this is a great question. What I would suggest is pruning by doing a heading cut or a reduction cut back by about a third to a half on the one that is less straight. And it's pretty obvious in the images which one that is. But we don't prune now, it's too cold, it's not close enough to the break of dormancy. We wanna wait probably until March, just before that tree begins to break dormancy. And one of the issues with maples, of course, is they're bleeders, so not to worry when that sap actually looks as though it is all running out of the tree. That's not really what's happening with that. All right, our second question actually comes to us from Omaha. And this is really interesting. This is a viewer who found these little things about half an inch across in the bottom of a stock tank. We're batting this one back and forth. We have a couple of theories. First of all, they look a little bit like a seed or a nut that could have fallen into it. And then an insect or a critter has done a bit of nibbling or biting. Dennis doesn't think it's a critter because it's too uniform. It's awfully smooth for a seed, but you'll notice that it's, it's valve. It's got a valve, it opens up. 
And then our great entomologist, Jim Kalish, thought, well, it looks a little bit like it could have been a Bt thuringiensis, of course, so Bacillus thuringiensis um, release of mosquito stuff. And what you're seeing is the slow release granules make that hole in it. We're going to take another thought about that and probably answer that again on a later show. We also thought it would be interesting for you to see what happened with some of those seeds that we were looking at to see whether or not they were still viable. And interestingly enough, I got almost 100% germination from the sweet peas. They're now vining themselves up on twigs in my kitchen, which is about the only place I have enough light. We got a little bit of germination from the corn, maybe 50%. We got absolutely one of the beet seeds to germinate. So again, to be able to test those older seeds and see whatever it is that you want to put in your garden, see whether it's viable enough that you're going to plant it or have to seed an awful lot of it to do it or just buy new seed, this is a really great way to do that. As we wrap up our show for today, we're going back to Jim and Kyle to talk more about keeping your fruit trees disease and insect free. We started today's program talking about what you can do when the trees are dormant. Let's hear about what it will take to have healthy fruit trees during the growing season. Today we have a whole array of products and strategies that are available for orchard spray situations, even small fruits, but we're going to be dwelling on apple. So what do you think, Kyle? Big job, isn't it, to cover It is. All? No, there's a lot, a lot that goes into control mm -hmm. of, um, of insects and diseases during the growing season. But one thing that's really critical when looking at pest management during the growing season is making sure that you time things correctly. Yeah, so whether that is at bud break or full bloom, et cetera. So we just want to go through a uh, growing yeah. season yeah, and talk yeah. about some of the things we would do. It's real handy to have those plant development phenologies to help yes. when to schedule sprays. And we have like a uh, bud break, just before the buds break, there's advantages in uh, applying insecticides for the control of mites and aphids and uh, other kinds of small insects that have hatched out and developed like leaf hoppers, et cetera. And so that's very handy. And then when we talk about getting into the pre-bloom, you know, the buds are starting to open up and you're starting to see the coloration of the blossoms. And then we have blossom time, which is the fullness of the, the blossoming is just beautiful in the orchard situations or in your home backyard. But blossom situations, do we do anything during that time? Um, in, in the entomological world, we do nothing because there's a concern about um, and any kind of injury done to our pollinating insects, such as the honeybees. That's, that's a good point. You really need to keep those mm -hmm. pollinators healthy. Um, there are a few diseases that you can control for during that blossom time. During that though. time. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to be controlling for apple scab or rust, um, that bloom time is a great time to, great time to be applying for it. Uh, you can all, fire blight will also often come in through the flower the flower buds. Yeah. And so this yeah. is also a great time to control for fire blight if you have a history of it in your in your area. So fungicides, no effects on pollinators. Uh, generally, no, That's no, good. they don't. That's really so. good. And so you have that window of opportunity there. Yes. And then our season doesn't really seriously begin until after petal fall, and that's when we would apply something for plum curculio which is a, a notorious pest that just really mangles the appearance of, of uh, <clears throat> the apple as it develops. And then we have codling moth, we have oriental fruit moth, a couple of generations there. So as we get well into the season after petal fall, almost up to harvest, it seems like we have an array of different kinds of insects that we need to be concerned about. Toward the latter part of the season, apple maggot and uh, that's when the apples are large and juicy and so those maggots are trying to capitalize on that resource before we can get our teeth into those apples. They're smart. <laughs> no, that's, that's lucky that with the insects you don't really have to worry about control until a little bit later in the season. I know with a lot of the, the fungal pathogens you want to start controlling for those really early, um, mm -hmm. almost right at bud break because there are as the, uh, as the buds are breaking and as those first leaves are starting to emerge, mm -hmm. if we have a, a cool, long, uh, prolonged spring, that just provides a lot of chance for those fungal pathogens to infect those newly emerging leaves. Yeah. But one of the great things about, about these diseases is there's a big environmental component to when they'll actually infect. 
Mm -hmm. And so in addition to looking at the growth stage of the, um, of the tree, it's also a good idea to monitor weather patterns. And so if we are going to have a lot of, um, going to have some moisture, you may want right, to do a, a yeah. fungicide spray. Yeah. During the course of a growing season, if you uh, very loyally follow an orchard spray, you might be applying um, 10, 12 sprays through that whole season. Right? Yeah, you know, every seven to 10 days, every, depending every on your 10, product. 14 days, maybe. Yeah. And there are alternatives. There's the wait and see approach, of course, and that would mean like in the insect world, you know, um, you would uh, try to do some monitoring before you would apply. So if you want to reduce your sprays, although there's some risk, orchard sprays I would say were probably the, the sure bet that you're going to have something nice and juicy yep. like some of these apples here. Uh, but we have monitoring devices such as sticky globes for apple maggot. We have pheromone traps uh, for codling moth, two generations per season. So whenever we see um, plum curculia, or I'm sorry, apple maggot here, on here, that means it's time to treat. Okay, maybe for a week or two afterwards, okay. it may be separated by a week to 10 days. Coddling moth, when you start seeing those in the traps, that means that you could go ahead and treat and keep following the populations through the season. Various kinds of strategies. Okay. Anything else you want to add, Kai? You know, the only, only thing about um, any time you do have a pesticide program, you do want to follow that pre-harvest interval. If we're yeah. going to be eating these apples, we need to make sure that there's been enough time between our last application and the time when we're going mm -hmm. to consume them that they are healthy enough to eat. Yeah, that would be right. Yeah. So check those labels, check the directions, pre-harvest interval before you can take that final Perfect. into a nice juicy apple. Mm -hmm. We hope you've enjoyed today's show about caring for fruit trees. But as we've just heard, understanding how important it is to keep up on your weather and the growth stage of your fruit trees will be the difference between wormy apples or hot apple pie or that great peach. Thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. Next time on Lifestyle Gardening, we'll be hearing about the results from an All-America test garden, starting seeds at home, and new products for the upcoming growing season. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good afternoon, good gardening. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.